This presentation is called Art and Shadow. My name is Carrie Ann Botta. Carl Jung is famous for formulating the concept of the shadow, the portion of our personality which, through the course of our life, is regulated to the darkness of the unconscious. Everyone carries a shadow, and the less it is embodied in the individual's conscious life, the blacker and denser it is. At all costs, it forms an unconscious snag, thwarting our most well-meant intentions. Here we see Peter from Peter Pan, and Peter knows that he needs his shadow. He is chasing his shadow so he can sew it back on. The shadow is part of what makes us whole. Every ego has a shadow. This is unavoidable. The adapting to and coping with the world, the ego quite unwittingly employs the shadow to carry out unsavory operations that it could not perform without falling into moral conflict. Without the ego's knowledge, these protective and self-serving activities are carried out in the dark. The shadow operates much like the nation's espionage system, without explicit knowledge of the head of state, who is therefore allowed to deny culpability. Although introspection can, to some extent, bring these shadowy ego operations to consciousness, the ego's own defenses against shadow awareness are usually so effective that little can penetrate them. When we are forced into confrontation with our shadow, it is either as a, as a result of being overwhelmed with self-destructive behavior, addiction, or a general stagnation and apathetic attitude. For sickness can be a stimulant to health, and a meeting with the shadow can mark the beginning of psychological rebirth. It is only when we are compelled by sickness to come to terms with our own nature and the opportunity may arise for us to experience the somber experience of the shadow as a messenger from the creative potential that lives within our own psyche. The unconscious cannot be conscious. The moon has its dark side. The sun goes down and cannot shine everywhere at once. Even God has two hands Attention and focus require some things to be out of the field of vision to remain in the dark. It is part of the destiny of modern humans that our way should first lead us down to the depths and not up to the heights. Is it then surprising that the guide who meets us as we set out on our journey should turn out not to be a shining angel of light, but a shadowy figure of our own evil. The shadow goes by many different names, the disavowed self, the lower self, the dark twin, the double, the repressed self, the alter ego. Meeting our demons, wrestling with the devil, the sent into the underworld, the dark night of the soul, and possibly a midlife crisis. Liz Green points out that the paradoxical nature of the shadow as both container of darkness and the beacon pointing toward the light. It is the suffering crippled side of the personality, which is both the dark shadow that won't change and also the redeemer that transforms one's life and alters one's values. The shadow is both the awful thing that needs redemption and the suffering redeemer who can provide it. So this is one of my own images. Uh, this is a painting called Melancholia with Demons from 2006. So part of this lecture is like a public service announcement. I went through a period uh, coming out of graduate school where I found a lot of energy almost like a, a nuclear computer, if I could go into my darkness, if I could, in a way, sing the blues, if I could speak about my own self, I don't know, inequity and um, deal with the travails, it was not as though I was not without difficulty. I was dealing with death and divorce, but in order to go into painting out of that realm, I had a tendency to recycle emotions. 
So this can induce a type of madness that is very productive for making art, but it's recycling emotions in the shadow in a negative way. There are many positive ways to process negative emotions through art. The majority of the creative arts is a type of therapy, but a cathartic painter, I was using my own emotions, I was painting out of my pain and my own happiness, and in a way I was manifesting those for a positive end, but after several years, I felt akin to like a female blues singer who was kind of suffering from their own addiction in a way. And I know that these usually leave to, you know, or result in uh, a more destructive act. So there was a need in 2012 to shed this way of making, to not paint out of my own sorrow, my own shadow so directly. And at that time I attempted to work out of painting out of the shadow of the world, um, trying to align in a different way. So in this period, I looked up what catharsis means to share one's emotion, but there's a second definition. If you were to ingest a cathartic, it's something that makes you defecate. So I became deeply aware that I was just sort of sharing my own shit and I wanted to have another way to relate to my own creativity. So I do love this painting very much. It's nine by 12 inches, it's painted out of oil. Um, I wrote a letter seemingly um, to Victoria Lucas, who this is a, a pseudonym for Sylvia Plath. So I assume in this letter, I'm writing to her about all of my difficulties and woes. And uh, in a way, self-aware, uh, here are, all of these demons who are reading along, singing joyously, laughing hysterically, because to indulge in your own sorrow makes the demons happy. So I was aware there was something imperfect about what I was doing, but at the same time, I could walk up to my easel and disappear for three days, uh, painting nonstop without food or sleep. So something seemed to be right about it, while something might have been terribly wrong. So where does shadow come from? And I will say, as I attempted in 2012 to like uh, separate myself from being so uh, steeped in shadow, that uh, I thought perhaps I could, you know, get ahead, process enough of it that I could be free of it. I didn't quite understand yet that we need it. It's serving valuable service, um, but you shouldn't wallow in it. During our development, certain traits and impulses were condemned by our family, peers, and educators, not out of care, but out of envy, fear, ignorance, and jealousy. Our proclivity to pr abide by social expectations also caused us to repress talents, innate abilities, and impulses, which if cultivated and developed had the potential to make us more effective beings in the world. Repression of positive qualities into our persona. As we grow up, we are encouraged to act like others, think like others. When we show individual deviation from the collective, we are then ostracized. We are taught that the way we are different does not grant us approval. So we hide our individuality, good and bad, into our shadow. Shunned, when we do not act as others, we suppress ourselves through a persona. The approval of others is what we seek. This is what uh, part, this is part of the socialization process. The demands of others exert power over us. So this is likened to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, um, a schism, a separation. They're not fully aware that they are the same being. Conscience is an internal sensor that tells us what is right and wrong and bad and unaccessible. It guides our personality and our destiny. People who repress themselves to appease the demands of others, they look good in the eyes of society, but with one individual, with one's individuality repressed into shadow, one will go on living, but the meaning of one's individual existence will be lost into sterility and stagnation.
So the expression of this is that we exist with a persona, a persona, also a mask, our ego. This is the operation that goes out into the world. This is how people know ourselves. The self is actually where the persona and the shadow meet. Part of the shadow is the anima and the animas. And this image on the left represents the telltale iceberg that the part of the iceberg that would be exposed beyond the water is that which is known that we know of ourselves. There is the middle ground, which is um, in a limited capacity available to us. And then there's the depth, this large part of the iceberg underneath that we just don't have as much access to. So this is Freud's view of the human mind, the mental iceberg. The conscious level is created and made up of thoughts and perceptions. The subconscious, the intermediate, is memories and stored knowledge, while the depths are in fear, violent motives, unacceptable sexual desires, irrational wishes, immoral urges, shameful experiences, and selfish needs. So it is never as obvious as when we have, for example, a politician who uh, might be incredibly conservative and representing family values, and then suddenly they're found in a hotel room with, um, could be a child, it could be someone of the same sex, it, it just could be a scandal and against their marriage. So any of these things where they are trying so hard to walk in a different light, to be militantly opt you know, oppositional to um, a more forgiving or fluid identity, and then you find out they are the thing themselves that they are attempting to repress in society. This is shadow. So as people repress themselves to appease the demands of others, to look good in the eyes of society, with one's individuality repressed into their shadow, one will go on living, but again, it's sterility and stagnation. To attract from family and societal collective, one must follow inner laws and separate oneself from the collective rules. To replace conditioning with individual solutions, make new values, create personal fulfillment, freedom, and innocence to create. Fullness of one's being. We are passive victims to the socialization process. The modern Western schooling system is founded on the need to create widespread obedience and create citizens that think alike, national uniformity in thought, word, and deed. This system which created conformists therefore repressed self-reliance, independence, and a will to stand up. So. This is another image purloined off the internet. So you can see that in the prior image, um, that unconscious level is more negative, fears, violent motives, unacceptable sexual desires, irrational wishes. In this interpretation, I like this one much better, we see how much creativity is under the surface of reality. And that this is generally just out of reach. And sometimes it takes art or counseling or therapy in order to unleash that stored creative energy. And down there also is intuition. I think this is into interesting because what is intuition? Uh, it might be wisdom from ourselves. We are keeping from ourselves. And sometimes when we receive intuition, it is as though um, something disembodied or separate from ourselves is speaking to us. Well, I always imagine this to be above my head and something like a higher self speaking to me. But in this model, uh, that intuition or unconscious may just be submerged and deep within uh, and that it might take a greater amount of psychoanalysis and assistance to bring some of these deeper things further towards light. The shadow is a moral problem that challenges the whole ego personality for no one can become conscious of the shadow without considerable moral effort. 
To become conscious of it involves recognizing the dark aspects of the personality as present and real. One of the artists who is incredibly successful at making those uh, considerable uh, moral difficulties clear is the work of Kara Walker. Kara Walker works in the style um, Victorian era or prior, honestly, uh, to photography, you would have had your silhouette cut out of black paper and this represented the individual. She takes this archaic method and utilizes it for contemporary art. The images are very, uh, you know, influenced by Freudian, the hind legs of this horse are the back legs of this woman and she is carrying this man, perhaps Anglo-Saxon man, this daughter, this child, carrying someone's head. So she's able to consciously make real the shadow, real the violence, real the racism and difficulty in society. There is no effective technique for assimilating the shadow. It is more like diplomacy or statesmanship, and it is always an individual matter. First, one has to accept and take seriously the existence of the shadow. Second, one has to become aware of its qualities and intentions. This happens through conscientious attention to moods, fantasies, and impulses. Third, a long process of negotiation is unavoidable. So, uh, this, these are the secrets uh, that you might keep from yourself, that you keep from your partner, that you hide from society. And how do they then inform uh, the world we live in? It, it would be an act of service for each of us to work on our shadow, to work through those things that we've sublimated. Um, I'm reminded when I was studying meditation in Colorado and Denver and uh, 2008, I took a workshop with a woman who had just gone to India. They had waited, you know, after international flights and got to this ashram and they were waiting for their guru to arrive. After several hours of waiting, he did indeed arrive, a thin brown man wearing a simple garment. And he walked into the room and said, greetings. At the end of this workshop, you will all become serial killers, which was much more shocking and, and not aligned with the, uh, I think probably most people's idea of the yoga retreat. Uh, to explain, his intention was that we spend so much time suppressing our true identity, our true self, or all of our uh, identity, that if we were to integrate our shadow, there would probably be these unwelcome, unlikely um, repercussions that would be more uh, perhaps bestial, more primitive, more um, not aligned with society, that we would actually be somewhat monstrous. And I think he was there to help mitigate the process. Um, in some way, I wish I had been at this workshop and not just uh, repeating the anecdote. One of the key elements in process of integrating the shadow is to recognize and reject or overcome the pathological social norms, values, and institutions which have led you to brand as negative and evil individual qualities, which are in fact life enhancing and necessary for your well being. But the shadow contains qualities along with qualities we repress, but also that there are just those which are destructive and evil. We never suspect that our own shadow is dangerous and you know, this exceeds our wildest dreams. We cannot pick and choose the positive. We must accept our whole shadow as a desirable and necessary part of ourselves. Stimulating self, simu I'm sorry, stimulating self-discovery this will keep us from looking into the depth of the abyss of our own darkness. The discovery of these destructive qualities can be traumatic 
to admit that one is infantile, maladjusted, unhappy, and ugly, a creature of the herd, is a shattering experience for anyone who has identified with the collective persona. The enemy of mankind is the drive to aggression and destruction in the structure of its own being. So here we have the persona, which means mask. And um, I will mention it is more, um, the more you repress your dark, the easier it is to create a persona of light. So um, I'm recollecting someone from my history that uh, shocked me deeply and kind of scared me a bit because they were uh, much darker than I thought. And someone else described them as someone uh, who walked like an angel, but she was really the devil. And I couldn't believe that someone's persona could be so seemingly full of light and then acerbic, painfully uh, malignant. Two ways to overcome this. A shattering of the ego that has overly identified with the persona. The primary phase is the process of self-transformation. Before a new state of being is born, the old one must perish. The drive to aggression and destruction within us has the capacity to manifest evil in our life and the world only when it remains repressed. If we can become aware of the sources of evil with the acknowledge, um, within acknowledge and explore them and learn to domesticate them and use the energy for positive ends. So again, warning, the brighter the social mask, the more darkness it generally conceals. So to investigate these further, the persona is the mask. It's that which goes to work for us and engages with social groups, the anima and the animus. So this is the idea that within us is the opposite gender, these qualities and attributes of the psyche. So um, within a woman would be an anim, or within a man would be an anima, and within a woman would be an animus in a heterogenitive society, um, in a more gender fluid society. This gets a little more complicated. However, it is that the sexual opposite of you resides within you and it informs your ideals of what you're looking for in a partner. So you have this ideal. Um, for example, if you have ever attempted to date someone and then you find out they're not who you thought they were, this is generally a uh, projection that you were wanting this person to be like the anima or animus within you and then you get closer to them and you realize that they are not. So rather than believing the difference and that you've discovered the truth and be grateful so you can move on, uh, very often we blame them for not being this match for inside of us, which is um, kind of unreasonable. The shadow, the dark side of the psyche, consists of repressed memories, ideas, emotions, weaknesses, desires, but also instincts. So some of this is wildness and chaos of the unknown. Uh, the shadow would be the person who uh, drinks a lot, going out at some point and takes off their shirt and steals the microphone away from the lead singer on stage and goes crazy. So the shadow won that day. Um, their uh, personality, the persona was removed and the mask came off and suddenly the shadow was taking control. And again, the self is the unification of conscious and unconscious. Um, it contains all aspects of the individual. So we, whether we like it or not, we are both. We just might not be using all of ourselves. So this is perhaps my favorite quote in the entire presentation. Each piece of shadow that we realize has a weight and our consciousness is lowered to that extent when we take it into our own boat. Therefore, one might say that the main art of dealing with shadow consists in the right loading of our boat. If we take too little, we float away from reality and become like a fluffy white cloud without substance into the sky. And if we take too much, we'll sink our boat. So we have to remain balanced to stay afloat, 
Um, how, how do you pack your life? You want to have substance uh, and not be someone who's too airy-fairy, but you also don't want to sink and crash and overload. One of the key elements in processing of and integrating the shadow is to recognize and reject or overcome the pathological social norms, values. Oh, I said that part, we're done with it. Okay, five tips for when you engage in shadow work. Center yourself, and what is centering? If you attempt to get to know your shadow self when you're not centered, you won't get constructive results. So centering, um, I think it's also akin to grounding. Um, well, one of my analogies for centering, if you have ever thrown a pot on a wheel and you don't throw the clay in the dead center, everything is wonky and wobbly. So uh, another time that this comes up, self-centeredness, is I have students, art students in particular, who really don't want to be selfish. And uh, I re remind them that, yes, you may not want to be selfish. And selfish, we consider bad, but you do need to be self-centered to some degree because if you externalize everything, then you've left nothing for yourself and then you have nothing to give anyone else. Kind of um, like when you're on the airplane and they ask you to put the mask on yourself before helping others. So reminding that, you know, eating three meals a day, sleeping regularly, hydrating, um, those would be number one in self-care and necessary to center. Second, cultivate self-compassion. You know, uh, we all make mistakes. We generally urge ourselves to do better and to uh, reform, but do that with compassion. Third would be self-awareness. Four, be courageously honest. And five, record your discoveries. So through the pandemic, I've seen this mentioned several times and it was part of the curriculum I was teaching just before the arrival of the pandemic. Um, so The Artist's Way is a very famous book for doing morning pages and it encourages people who are stuck creatively, which would insinuate their shadows growing and not being processed, that they wake up and write and that this will help them from uh, really like a state of dis-ease, a state of being out of grace, that this is, again, part of the exhaust system to write and to read your own writing and to keep a record are seem to be uh, ways that you can become self-aware. What is especially interesting is the idea that the shadow contains not just destructive aspects of the personality, but also potent, creative, and powerful capabilities. So I also would like to mention uh, a quote from the Book of Thomas. This is one of those books that was found in the Nag Hammadi. If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. So again, it's our responsibility to be a creative being, to cultivate this, that this we cannot just be all work and no play um, and giving ourselves to others and our labor, that to be a creative is to be a healthy person. Um, I am reminded, for example, that Hitler was a failed artist. If he had been more successful in his creative pursuits, the 20th century very well potentially could have gone a different way. So let's talk about creativity and shadow. The shadow is looking for a way to express itself. So the shadow is looking for a way out. Creativity is the safest way to do this. And with that said, uh, art is the safest place to put one's emotions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I took it a little too far, but you're also talking to somebody who is painting, oh, I don't know, upwards of 70 hours a week. And I was, you know, sitting on a nuclear generator of self-destruction ultimately. Um, but there are healthy ways to do this. 
you know, write in your journal and record your new discoveries about yourself. That's one of the remedies that we discussed. Writing your insights and reviewing them later helps encode the discoveries into your awareness. Use guided meditation, including imaginary characters and dream personalities. I'll give an example of this. Um, my students will be doing an assignment that works with an alter ego. You might recall Bruce Wayne is Batman. So Batman would I embody the repressed shadow energy of Bruce Wayne. Well, uh, while we all shouldn't become bat-like vigilantes per se, it's, that's something for fiction, we can exercise this liberally through uh, film, through music, through painting, through writing. So this is the fodder for creative energy. Consider painting a painting of your shadow self. Allow your dark feelings, voice, and poetry or sketches. Um, I'm a participant in a few subgenres. One is the dark art movement. And uh, in general, these are some of the nicest people you will ever meet because they are constantly working with and dealing with their shadow. So I do feel like they're very conscious of the dark and aware of the messages that it does have to deliver to others. Um, in fact, the word monster comes from the word manere, which means to warn. So monsters become a kind of uh, exhaust system for society. Five benefits of shadow work. You will improve your relationships, have clearer perception, enhanced energy and physical health, psychological integration, greater creativity and maturity. Um, at this point, uh, in society, I can hardly think that any of us can afford not to have a creative outlet. Uh, this work on the right is from the beautiful Camille Rose Garcia. Her work, you can see a crying woman in the middle and all of nature coming to uh, support her around them. Her work very often is uh, dealing with her own emotions and anxieties and fears, but she portrays them in beautiful electric colors. Shadow work requires we respond to life with our undeveloped traits and instinctual sides to live what Jung called the tension of opposites, holding both good and evil, right and wrong, light and dark in our own hearts. Wholeness is attained by embracing our creatureliness, limitation, fears, and neuroses, as well as the beast within us as not only the beast within us is not only necessary but also desirable without which we would like depth and breadth our connection to earth and our animal past so these two quotes are very nearly similar but nietzsche says it is the same with the human being as with the tree the higher they climb into the height and light the more strongly their roots strive earthward, downward, into the dark, the depth, the evil. And then Jung said it this way, likened to the growth of a tree as emphasis on a growth toward the sky, without a corresponding growth of our roots downwards into the depths would result in personal decay or even catastrophe. So again, this recompense this uh, balance. So as you know, another way of saying is the greater the light, the greater the shadow, the greater these branches go up, the, mo the more support you need in your roots, the more stability. Another Camille Rose Garcia on the left. The artist's task is to save the soul of mankind and anything less is dithering while Rome burns. Because of the artist, the artists who are self-selected for being able to journey into the other realms. If the arts cannot find the way, then the way cannot be found. So this gives credit to artists for bringing sensitivity and awareness. And lastly, in cultivating compassion, we draw from the wholeness of our experience, our suffering, our empathy, as well as our cruelty and terror. 
It has to be this way. Compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It's a relationship between equals. Only when we know our own darkness well can we be present with the darkness of others. So it's incumbent upon us to learn how to process our own pain and suffering so we can be of benefit to others. This makes us a better wife or husband. It makes us a better mother or father. It makes us a better member of society that we can deal with ourselves and therefore help others when it's needed. Thank you very much for listening to this lecture.